Thank you. I'm glad that Ken started by talking about conversation. That word comes from Latin roots that mean to turn with, to turn with others. When it came into English around the year 1300, it didn't mean using words. It meant spending time with other people. There's a concept in common law, criminal conversation, that means spending too much time with the wrong person. It's not about speech. It's a legal term for adultery. Criminal conversation might also be a fruitful lens for thinking about how our species has abused and harassed and violated Mother Earth. We've often stolen what belongs to the whole community of life, and we've often alienated the particular affection of indigenous peoples for all their life-giving relatives. We're here today in search of deeper conversation among human wisdom traditions. Wisdom is about knowing. The word comes from a root that means to see or to know the way. Wisdom traditions teach ways of knowing and they include the world's great religions as well as the scientific method. These wisdom traditions teach particular ways of knowing. Religious or faith traditions are more often concerned with the meaning of life and how to live a good life. The scientific tradition seeks to understand how things work. Both of them are interested in origins, development, and interconnectedness. They are natural conversation partners, even though they begin with rather different questions. The conversation between faith and science was far more integrated before the Enlightenment. In a time when theology was called queen of the sciences, rationality has been privileged in recent centuries in ways that have certainly improved our understanding of how the world and the cosmos work yet also in ways that have compromised our appreciation and valuing of diversity and interdependence. Particularly in our American context, we can regularly see four attitudes at least toward conversation between religion and science. The first one insists that the other tradition has nothing to say like public school boards who want to pro prohibit teaching evolution, or the snide remark that something is just a myth or only a theory. Myths are wisdom stories about the origins and the meaning of life. Theories are wisdom stories about how things work or change, and all of them reflect a deep understanding of truth. The second attitude about science and religion acknowledges that the two fields have something to say, but only if they don't intersect. Science teaches how the heavens go. Religion teaches how to go to heaven. <laughs> A third kind of conversation moves beyond mutual incomprehensibility to recognize that both science and religion use metaphor and symbolic or poetic language, and they can be mutually enlightening, particularly at the interesting and edgy boundaries between them, like the soft hair on black holes that retains something of what they've swallowed up. I want to encourage the even deeper mutuality of a fourth way, in which thinking with both hemispheres rational and intuitive, or looking with a scientist's eye and a sacred eye yields far deeper, far greater depth perception. That is one of wisdom's goals. Scientific and religious wisdom traditions have a great deal in common, beginning with the reality that both rely on faith, faith that something is knowable, at least to a degree, 
and faith that practicing the tradition yields reasonably consistent outcomes. Both faith and science are communal activities with habits and disciplines that guide the pursuit of wisdom. Wonder and curiosity drive the passion of both groups. Each looks for truth as well as beauty or elegance. Religion and science <clears throat> look for goodness, understood as consistency, fairness, or justice. Both traditions develop theories and test their knowledge before claiming it as the best truth that can be known at present. That accumulated wisdom is published in oral narratives or in the written scriptures of religion or peer-reviewed journals. Truth is ultimately judged in community where change happens both in the slow accretion of knowledge and sometimes in radical paradigm shifts. Change among human beings is almost always accompanied by resistance and anxiety, and it's far greater when it involves the paradigm shifts of new revelation, like the emergence of Christianity or Islam, or in scientific revolutions, like Einstein's theory of relativity. Reformations can be almost as challenging and bloody. Think about translating scripture into the vernacular or the shift from an earth-centered universe to a cosmic view. Only deep and persistent conversation can eventually produce the necessary conversion of head and heart to another way of relating to the world. Wisdom traditions include broadly defined sources of authority that push us beyond personal idiosyncrasy and that challenge people to amend or renounce earlier understandings in favor of new and deeper wisdom. Religious traditions call that repentance and amendment of life. Scientists call it refining the theory Both assert the need for humility about the limits of knowing. Both science and religion enforce norms of discourse that require communal affirmation of change and growth. Sometimes holding liminal spaces or suspending judgment for a time permit further inquiry. As particle physics wrestles with string theory, or religious groups wrestle with new understandings of human sexual variety. In the present search for wisdom about the changing nature of this planet, we are long past the threshold of truth that's demanded by both wisdom traditions. It's abundantly clear that human activity is disrupting and destroying the life-giving character of this planet and its ability to support the kind of life that has existed here for countless millennia. I'm convinced that conversation is the only thing that leads to conversion of heart, mind, and deed. Our planetary conversation must engage both spheres of inquiry, for we need the best and deepest wisdom about our manner of living and its consequences for all life on this planet. We need the passion of poets and the clinical clarity of scientists, and we need the kind of transformative bridges that both the first two speakers have talk talked about if we and our fellow inhabitants are going to survive. Scientists of varied disciplines have clearly demonstrated the trajectory of a warming earth, shrinking ice cover, rising sea level, intensifying storms, spreading disease, and the growing extinction of species and biomes. Our own species is threatened, 
along with many others on whom life depends for breath, food, and nutrient recycling. We have the data and we understand the mechanisms of global warming, yet all sorts of non-rational responses get in the way of changing how we live. Fear, anxiety, willful blindness, and blatant short-term self-interest prevent us from repenting or turning around and going in a more life-giving direction. Human beings need hope, hope that solutions are possible. We need compassion for suffering neighbors. And on this planet, we are all neighbors. And we need a will to do justice, for we are all in this together. The world's great faith traditions agree on a moral baseline that's usually called the golden rule. Stated positively, it's treat others as you wish to be treated. Different traditions have developed and nuanced that baseline. Two strands of the Judeo-Christian wisdom tradition define the basics as love God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself. And do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Loving God, self, or neighbor implies intimate conversation that leads to knowing one's limits and leads to respect for the other. That conversation can help to produce compassion or mercy, which at the level of a community or nation is called justice. The Abrahamic traditions developed in a context where water was precious and settlements were often widely separated and hospitality was understood as the touchstone of a good life. Former slaves were repeatedly reminded not to oppress others, but to care lovingly for those without the resources to sustain their lives, widows and orphans, travelers, migrants, and the poor who didn't have access to farmland or pastures. Faithful people were challenged to care for the least and the lost and the left out. Sabbath rest became a hallmark of those traditions as a counterpoint to slavery. Sabbath rest extended not only to the faithful human beings, but to animals and slaves and visitors and even the land fallowed every seventh year. That wisdom acknowledges and respects the diversity of communities on which life depends. The Jain tradition goes even far farther and teaches radical respect for life, even in the form of filtering one's own breath lest an insect be inhaled and die, and vigilance about walking lest a small creature be crushed awe and wonder at the wild exuberance of life is part of what wisdom traditions teach. Respect and care can grow from that experience of transcendence. Compassion for other lives and forms of life, born of humility that recognizes finitude and interrelatedness can transform human attitudes and actions. We may clearly understand the scientific conclusions and the need for amendment of life, but resistance reigns. The will to amend our lives comes in humble and vulnerable conversation with others. Can we be merciful to other species? Can we feel compassion for Pacific Islanders whose homes are literally disappearing beneath the waves? Will we do justice for our children, grandchildren, and neighboring species and generations? 
The language is almost four centuries old, yet John Donne's brief poem points toward that bridging of head and heart, that binding of life to life, and that conversation between planet and living beings. He wrote, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. The bell tolls for the great circle of life on this planet. Seek wisdom to see each living creature as part of one vast whole. Live with wisdom and compassion, caring for every life, and spend your life in conversation toward justice for life on this planet. Bishop Catherine, I, um, I, I, I think uh, I, you, you, were, you were talking about the declaration of interdependence, that we have the declaration of independence, the framework in which the enlightenment and how we find ourselves, and you're challenging us now to begin this journey of interdependence across a wide range of conversations. And we, we're not going to be able to do it all in this three minutes, but later on, <laughs> I do want us to, I think you have just, yeah. from my mind, you have just said we need to talk about that interdependence. Um, say something. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I love that you say this, because um, we're on the same page here, um, because we do actually have a declaration of interdependence, um, and it's called the Earth Charter. It came out of the Rio conference. It took 10 years to write. The beginning is we're part of a vast evolving universe. That's the prologue. Mm -hmm. um, Earth, our home, is alive with a myriad community of life, which was science mm -hmm. and indigenous peoples. I was part of the drafting committee. That was an intentional mm -hmm. coming together. But the three parts of it are ecological integrity, mm -hmm. social economic justice, democracy, nonviolence, and peace. So ecology, justice, and peace mm -hmm. are the three uh, poles mm -hmm. of this interdependence. Mm -hmm. So the good news is the human community has been thinking towards mm -hmm. getting out of hyper-individualism, which has its positive things, but towards a, really a declaration of interdependence. Mm -hmm. And I think we can get behind that mm -hmm. as it moves forward. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for <laughs> your amazingly inspirational words. Um, I, I do think we need a, a, a renewed commitment to inter interdependence. And I think one of the most challenging aspects and where we really need to stretch as humanity is it's not just, even though this is a big one, recognizing that our fates of the current people living on Earth are, are connected, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but to be connecting to future generations. Yeah. Um, and that is really the challenge of climate change, in, in, uh, among other things, because while we are mm -hmm. suffering the impacts now, mm -hmm. 
um, we're, we're either suffering them directly from extreme weather events or we're paying for, for, for repairs to things. It's really future generations that are going to bear the brunt. And, and, and the, 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 the challenge for humanity is, is, to, is to somehow realize that what we do now, it, it determines the fate of future generations. And for me, I, I, I think the, the best way to imagine that is to think about my kids and my grandkids and their grandkids, because that's very personal to me. I think mm -hmm. it's hard for people to think about 2100 and mm -hmm. the polar ice caps melting, but right, right. they can think about their grandkids or their great grandkids. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, the kind of thinking it's gonna take to get to that level of interdependence. But it's, it's a, it's a it, as you pointed out, it, it's, it's a massive challenge. And again, I come back to what I said. I think it's more religion than science that's gonna get us to think in those terms. Uh, science can provide the facts, we can provide the what, but it, I think it's religion and spirituality that provides the why. Kathy, yes. <laughs> One more question for Catherine before we have Sarah to come up and bring some of our students. But Catherine, a little bit more about, um, which I loved, um, the, the, the notion of repentance among scientists. Yeah. You know, they just never repent. <laughs> yeah. um, I know they do, but, uh, but I thought that was a wonderful yes. way of uh, Ken's nodding because they don't, right? <laughs> but uh, a wonderful way of combining, uh, it made me think mm -hmm. about Copernicus and about uh, what that would require of people within the faith community and the science community to say, wait a minute, we've got this whole thing wrong. That, but that, at, at the heart of that is humility, whether you're a scientist or in the faith community. Isn't that a little bit about kind of what you were saying there? Yes, I, I think that we don't change until we recognize something that needs to be altered. Um, and it is, I think, the, the religious impulse that, that challenges our arrogance. Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, there is always possibility for change and growth. And I think it's the invitation into that without humiliating people, yeah. Yeah. but reminding us that we are creatures of the earth, mm -hmm. ultimately. 